nothing. Very odd. Everywhere, most of the time we're unaware, but horses snow we're leaking all the time. When looking in the fridge, when Calvin does the bidding bridge, the sergeant allows for fun and for the prize. Because sergeant allows are with us all the time. With this power consumption interface, you mean rubber? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, can you really mount DPA attacks with that? Yeah, that works. That actually works. I guess there are a bunch of other interfaces as well, right? What is really missing in the show, and this seems like the last chance to add it, is that these components and behaviors like caches, speculation, uh, buffers, and uh, resource contention, they also exist on the software level. Not just on the hardware level, as we've looked at in all those episodes, but also just in software. And there, you might have perfectly secure and side-channel resilient hardware, and still these software-based channels would exist. Like? Like the page cache. Um, in this episode, I would like to focus on the page cache. So there are even system calls where you can basically probe the state of the operating system. What do they do? Wait here. Mincor. It indicates whether an address is resident in the core or not. Resident in the core? That's, that's a complicated way to say if data is in memory or not. The thing the viewers need to know here is that the operating system has a page cache. And whenever something is loaded from the disk, the page cache buffers it in blocks of 4 kilobytes. And when you access it again, it's served from the page cache. Oh. Wow, so for flush and reload, we had to observe whether something is resident in cache or not. By observing timing levels, but here we can observe it directly. Hmm. So with MinCore, you can check it actually with absolute certainty yes. whether or not a page is in the cache. Again, no one. I'm not sure what they are doing there. Maybe someone is probing on us, checking if we're home? <laughs> I don't know. So, Sminker, if you use this to check whether a page is in the page cache, yeah. is it already a side channel? Side channel? Did you find a new attack? It's not a side channel. The interface directly tells you whether something is in the main memory or not. Ah. But if you do something, use it to leak secret information, wouldn't that make it a side channel? Okay, um, let me try that. Look at this. Mm -hmm. I can transmit data through a cover channel through uh, using the page cache. I use the min core function to check whether a page is resident in memory or not. Mm -hmm. And then evict the whole memory by accessing a lot of other data from other files that also occupy the page cache. That's pretty bad, mm -hmm. but can you, can you leak anything more valuable? User input, passwords or cryptographic keys maybe? Or crypto keys? Mm, probably not. It's, it's the page cache. It caches pages, 4 kilobytes, right? Mm. That will be probably two cores for most crypto implementations. Yeah. Also, um, I think it's, it's slow, right? Because the page cache will have to occupy all unused memory, right? Yeah, but I think that's a good thing, right? If you occupy the unused memory, otherwise it would be unused, right? And then if you, if you cache all the things from the disk in main memory, it should be faster and it should cost less energy to use it. I also want to highlight the connection to page deduplication attacks here. Um, page deduplication attacks, uh, there um, the operating system or hypervisor will scan for identical pages. And what you can do now is uh, when you access such a deduplicated page, you will get a higher timing difference, a copy on write page, right? because it has to um, duplicate it again. And what the attacker can now do is, uh, the attacker can craft a page with very specific content that it suspects somewhere in memory and repeatedly write to that, write the same value there again and again and again. 
And if at some point there is a spike in the timing, then the attacker learns that there was an identical page like that in memory. So this basically forms an oracle whether the victim has a page like that or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and people built various attacks based on that, like OS fingerprinting, right? even byte by byte leakage, and also recently they showed that it's exploitable in a remote setup. Yeah, anyway, let's get back to page cache attacks. The page cache is quite huge, mm -hmm. so I have to evict a lot of memory, right? So probably the almost the size of the RAM. So multiple gigabytes of memory. It's multiple gigabytes. And that will be slow. Mm -hmm. The attack that I performed some months ago with, uh, with DRAM, mm -hmm. the DRAM drama side channel, spying yeah. on other users when they watch YouTube, for instance, mm -hmm. that should also be doable with this page cache, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'll try that. Oh, wow. Wow, guys, that, that actually works. Really? That is all. You see, wow. the YouTube video is running and I can see with the page cache that there is some cache activity. Wow. Yeah, and if I, I stop the top. It stops. It, it stops. really works. Can you buy on keystrokes with that? The thing is, when you, when you discover a new side channel, usually you want to explore different, um, different aspects of the side channel, different characteristics. So you want to check does it perform well on something like a cryptographic uh, algorithm? Can you leak a cryptographic key? And this is something uh, that is part of this standard evaluation that all the papers uh, now do. So they take some vulnerable crypto implementation and then they try to leak the key. Yeah. But um, keystrokes? I mean, obtaining super precise keystrokes? I mean, that's difficult. That's difficult. I mean, think about the swiping, right? So ah. trans transitioning from, from one pin to another, that, that could work, right? You can look at the inter keystroke timings and then you can probably build some patterns based on that or templates. Yeah, yeah. For crypto, for crypto, that is much easier because crypto usually has this repeatable setting. You can uh, run uh, the same encryption again and again and again. Even a very bad side channel can obtain a crypto key. But for keystrokes, yes, it's a completely different story because it's not generally not repeatable. You can't ask the user to type in the password five million times, but you can ask a cryptographic algorithm to do the encryption five million times. Um, yeah, so you're right. Keystroke timing attacks can be way more difficult and then uh, the keyboard input way more difficult to recover than cryptographic keys. I don't know. So how would I find them? Maybe with a template attack. Programming and everything. Mm -hmm. Oh, hi. Hey. Daniel. Um, about the graduation ceremony. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have time for a small speech by students. Would you have uh, time to do that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Any specific topic that we should talk about? Not really. Maybe something about your study, something that made an impression, had a lasting impact. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Great, thank you. I came up with some optimizations here, look. So you can first use templating on a different layers, for instance. You first template with a four kilobyte granularity yeah. using the page cache. And then, when you, once you found activity there in a certain region, you ah. can use the more fine-grained one, the 64-byte granularity of flush and reload channel. Wow. Yes. And I think this, this generalizes even further. You could start off with 512 gigabyte regions using the TLB or maybe some page table bit channels that we have looked at some weeks ago. Yeah. Then you go down to one gigabyte, then to two megabytes, then to four kilobytes, and then to 64 bytes. And that way you would minimize the runtime for the templating. Yes, yes, I think you're right. But I think w with the four kilobyte granularity, I already found something. I, I scanned the Chrome binary. But that is huge, right? Yeah, yeah. it's about 200 megabytes. Okay. Oh. And? Yeah, look at that. Oh, wow, yeah. 
I can distinguish any key you're entering in Chrome just by looking at the page cache. Can you show me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, look at that. I pressed it. Wow. Wow. Yeah. You see the activity? I just sent a mail to Google that is really a severe vulnerability and they need to fix it. So let's maybe talk about mitigations here. In the page cache attack paper, we looked at different parts, attacks on Windows and attacks on Linux. And, and on Windows eviction was quite easy, right? Oh yeah, yeah, they had some legacy interface that was originally intended for a completely different purpose that also flushed pages from the page cache. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So what could be the solution here? Remove this interface? Same, same for MinCore probably also. Remove it or make it privileged or just provide the information about pages um, that no one else shares with you. Yeah, yeah, but there are other syscalls as well, right? Like period v2 yeah. can be also used for that purpose. And you have to think there might be applications that use these syscalls as well. Yeah, so you might break backwards compatibility and then what do you gain? You could always just resort to timing attacks as well on these caches. Yeah. So. Could you instead make the eviction less predictable or restrict its impact? Maybe working set algorithms. Working set algorithms are less susceptible because they maintain a working set per process. And those pages that are in the working set, they may not be evicted or should not be evicted. Um, but then again, on Windows, this didn't stop our attack because uh, on Windows, you can set the working set size to a very, very small value. And what about the attack on Chrome? How do you mitigate that one? There are compiler effects that introduced these side channels. So there was string deduplication active, which caused the single key events to be on different pages. So this even made the attack more powerful. Mm -hmm. okay. And more vulnerable to these side channels. Uh, you recorded the demo there for the vulnerability disclosure. Can you show the demo that we recorded? Oh yes, yes, I can open it. Here you see some conversation on, on Signal desktop. Wait, how can you record the keystroke from Signal? So Signal is, is Chromium based, so they all use the same framework. So there are a lot of applications which are susceptible to this kind of attacks. And here I, I enter uh, some keystrokes into the banking app in Chrome. And you see they get really nicely recovered. So this is, this is a huge problem. If this works on all Chromium-based applications, this is really bad, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's see what they say to that. That's really impressive. Mm -hmm. And then they will go to the award ceremony, which will be super awesome. The Dean of Computer Science will be there. Sure. Did you ask him? Sure, sure, sure. And the rector of the university will be there? Sure. Of course. Really? Of course. Yeah. And the president of Austria will be there? What? Yeah. And Santa Claus will be there. With this, I would like to hand over to Irene and Daniel for the graduate speech. Thank you. Studying means growing as a person. It is not a mere collection of knowledge. We are not walking encyclopedias. It is the experience you make. It is the failures and successes you had. The situations you mastered, the lessons you learned. And a lot of these learnings, we had to figure them out on our own. And the topic that never left us was side channels. Side channels are everywhere. And we learned so much about them. In the real world. Checking the fridge. Cheating in games. Cheating in shows and in sports. We figured out how caches work and how they can be exploited. And how attacks can be mitigated. With constant time code. 
we figured out that many mitigations do not work in practice. And it's not just hardware caches. Also branch prediction leaks and various buffers leak. And DRAM leaks. And software caches also leak. And if you automate these attacks, it gets particularly bad. One significant step was also when we uh, produced physical side channel attacks in the software world. Measuring power consumption, we moved these physical attacks to the software world. Indeed, side channels had a lot of impact, not only on us. But that is not the end of side channels. It is a beginning. Transient execution attacks like Meltdown, like Spectre, they showed that side channels can be even more powerful tools than we knew before. And beyond these, we have seen fault attacks from software. Breaking our illusion that computers are reliable digital systems. They are not, but this may also be a good point to look into the future. What will we see? More side channels? More fault attacks? Is Spectre indeed here to stay? With systems that share more and more components across security domains, what else can we expect? And as we grew up in our studies and graduate now, side channels also grew up since the late 90s and have escaped their childhood realm of attacks on cryptographic algorithms. And evolved into much broader problems. Present in practically every system. Leaking various data and necessitating countermeasures. Side channels are everywhere. And most people are unaware even in the security industry. And that is where we will be needed. Finding and mitigating side channels. Because, as you said, side channels are everywhere. <laughs>